have given me the heritage of those who fear your name. Has everybody in the world been given the heritage of those who fear the name of the Lord? I think the answer to that is fairly obvious. And I have observed in my years of working with the church that when people stand up in the pulpit and dare to try to preach and teach God's truth, that they act very confident of what they're saying. Have you noticed that? Just like they know everything. And I want to try to look that way this morning, but the fact is my knees are knocking. I don't know whether you realize how much those of us who now realize we don't know everything feel uncomfortable when we're up trying to declare truth for fear that maybe we've got a wrong slant on something or that we're going to be misunderstood. Well, I'm going to start out this morning by asking what I think are some very rhetorical questions where the answers are quite obvious. And I've got a point that I want to make. Do we have anybody here this morning who had a choice as to who their biological father and mother would be? Not a soul. No. Did anyone here this morning have a choice as to when they were born and where they were born and what the culture and mood and circumstances of the world around them happened to be when they were born? No, nobody had a choice. None, none of us. Okay, did your family tree or your place of birth, or your time of birth, the place in history, did that have any effect at all on your progression of learning and the way you think right now? Did it have any effect on your being here today? Well, the answer to all of that, I think, seems pretty obvious. Well, let's shift gears for just a moment. I'm talking about our family tree from the standpoint of who our mother and daddy may have happened to be, have been, which we had no choice about. Uh, individually, we had no choice about what was going on in the world, what the attitudes of the culture around us were at the time we were born. Do you think that if you had have been born in the bush country of Africa that you would likely be sitting here today? Or if you were born in China, or if you had been in, born in Siberia during the days of the Bolshevik Revolution, after which atheism became the official religion of the Soviet Union. What are the likelihoods that you'd be sitting here today with the value system and the faith in the Bible and in the message of the gospel? Is there a chance that it would have been different with you? I want you to think about congregations. We talk about churches. Those of us who have a strong background in the churches of Christ know that there is only one church worldwide, the body of Christ. So when I talk about church or we talk about churches, what we're really talking about are individual congregations because they tell us there's a few billion people that claim to belong to Christ worldwide, we couldn't fit them all into one building. And so those who purport to be following God's word and following the Lord Jesus Christ 
they, they gather together in what we call congregations. In other words, where we assemble, where we congregate. And do, does any of your background have anything to do with where you congregate? Do churches, and I'm talking about congregations, not the church, but do congregations have a family tree? I'm not talking about a mother and a daddy, but I'm talking about were there circumstances in history that caused a certain congregation to be formed at a certain place at a certain time and does that history of what caused that congregation to be formed have anything to do with the practices, the traditions of that particular congregation? Or does it have anything to do with the kind of relationships that we have with other congregations? Wake up. I want you to... I want you to answer these questions and think with me, okay? Maybe you know, maybe you don't know that this particular building where this particular group of people, this congregation assembles, was formed in the late 1950s. I don't have the exact date, Gene May. Okay, you got it right there. It is the late 1950s. And uh, are you aware that this particular congregation was started, established by the old West Amarillo Church of Christ that was located over at 5th and McMaster's? That church doesn't even exist anymore. And that church at that time was very closely associated with the Forest Hill Church of Christ that was out in northeast Amarillo, and that church doesn't even exist anymore. But this church has a history. And do you suppose that the history of this church has anything to do with how we think and our traditions and our practices? And I could go further and I could say that that old West Amarillo Church of Christ that established, helped establish this church was very closely related with other churches in the Panhandle and down. I mean, the Turkey Church of Christ was very influential in that church. And, and uh, oh, there were churches that, like in Kittaquay, and, and uh, we're very closely associated with churches of Christ in Lubbock, like the Quaker Avenue Church of Christ. And... Uh, there are lots of other churches around that we don't have a whole lot of interaction with. What is behind all of that? I'm talking about all of this, dear brothers and sisters, because of the fact you may be wondering, are you going to talk to us anything about the Bible? Yes, sir. I surely am. I am concerned I am becoming passionate about the prayer of Jesus Christ in John chapter 17 when he was not only praying for himself as he was about to undergo the ordeal of the crucifixion and then as he was praying for his followers, his immediate disciples who were going to be going through a lot of trials and tribulations and persecutions and he was praying for them. But did you know, you know, before the prayer was over with, he was praying for us because he was praying that all of those who would follow after him through the teaching of his disciples, that they all might be one, Father, just as we are one. I am in you, you are in me. I pray, Lord, that all of them might be one, that the world might believe. Are you aware of the fact 
that our world is slipping. All of the statistical indications that I can pick up indicate to us that our world is slipping further and further away from God right now. Our country is turning more secular. I saw more people walking their dogs this Sunday morning on the way to church, I believe, than I see in the building here. We probably have more people in Potter and Randall County that are doing something else today rather than being in a church building somewhere because that is the direction that our culture is headed. Do you suppose that it's maybe that so many people in the world say, well, the churches don't know what they're talking about. They can't even agree among themselves. Would it be possible if we could put up a more united front? I don't mean everybody meet in the same building. That, would, that, that probably would not be practical, but if we could just have a more tolerant spirit of unity with all of those who confess Christ as the Son of God, Let's change directions for just a moment here. I'm going to say that to belong to this congregation, if you really feel like you fit in to this congregation, you nearly certainly are going to have to believe in a God. Further than that, not just any God, if you're going to belong to this congregation and really feel like you're a part of this congregation, you're probably going to have to believe in the God that is described in the book we call the Bible. That collection of holy writings that spans centuries and lots of different writings, but all compiled together into one book that we call the Bible. You may find it difficult to feel like you're really a part of this group if you don't believe in that God that's described in the Bible, which, of course, means believing in that God when he became incarnate, born into the world to show us his nature. And probably to belong to this congregation, you're going to have to believe, or to at least to feel like you fit in, you're going to have to believe that the Bible is the inspired, authentic truth that God wanted to reveal to us to help us understand his nature and how we're supposed to live and what our future holds. In other words, you, you need to believe that the Bible is the word of God and that it's authoritative. Wouldn't you agree with that? I mean, it's not that we would lock somebody out and tell them not. I think we would welcome anybody to come in and study. But this congregation stands for belief in the God of the Bible and the truth of God's word, the authority, authenticity of the Bible. Now, do you realize how many churches there are just in Potter and Randall County Hundreds of congregations and that almost all, if not all, of them believe in God, the God that is revealed in the Bible, and believe that the Bible is the teachings of the word of truth. I know there are all kinds of theories about what the inspiration of Scripture means, but I'd say probably most of the churches believe in the God of the Bible, and they believe that the Bible is authoritative. And yet, we feel very little unity with the majority of those churches. And furthermore, most of them don't feel any real unity with us. They may hardly know we even exist. We hardly know they exist. Is that really what you believe that the Lord Jesus Christ had in mind when he prayed that they all might be one just as we are one that the world may believe? Well,
we're, we're tasked with trying to understand how to apply the Bible to our individual lives, a Bible that was assembled finally about 2,000 years after its completion, and then we've got to understand how our modern culture, through our heritage, makes us interpret the scriptures in our world of today. I, I hope I'm not confusing anybody. I want to see if I can make us understand how it is that where we were born, to whom we were born, what the heritage of our particular congregation is causes us to read and apply the scriptures as we do. Let me, let me give you a couple of three really, really common examples. We do not wash one another's feet in this congregation. Although Jesus commanded it, he exemplified it, and yet we don't do it. Why? Well, because we say that was a different cultural circumstance back then, and I believe that's true. I don't want you to wash my feet. You probably don't want me to wash your feet. We're not walking up and down those dusty roads in sandals as they did back then. And so, I was kind of watching this morning, and I didn't see a single soul come in here and greet anybody with a holy kiss. The Bible tells us to do that. I'm not sure if I'd have seen any of you trying to kiss somebody else if I would have thought it was holy. <laughs> Might have been a little suspicious of that. The customs... We're different, and it causes us, because of the time and place where we are born, to read the scriptures a little differently. I'll tell you what, in today's world, even in our churches, you'll see some men that have long hair, and you'll see ladies that have short hair, and I can read some scriptures to you in the Bible that would indicate hairstyles make a lot of difference. Well, they did at some point. We don't seem to be very hung up on that right now. Why, why, why are we so different? We, we sang, we're in the habit, it's our tradition here, to sing songs as we're observing the Lord's Supper. I can remember once upon a time when there was a young man that spontaneously started singing more love to thee, O Christ, during the Lord's Supper, and he got publicly rebuked from the pulpit before the service was over for doing that. What causes us to have these strange habits. I attended a church very recently where when they got ready to serve the Lord's Supper, instead of doing it like we do it, they had trays with a little individual piece of bread and a little individual communion cup all in one unit, and they had two aisles instead of one center aisle like we do, and, and when they got ready to serve the communion. They had two servants of the church stand up at the front with those trays in hand, and they had everybody, they gave one prayer, and they had everybody to file out like you were being ushered in or out of a funeral or something of the sort to come up to the front, take that little cup, go around to the side and back to the seat. And <laughs> Guess what? I found myself saying, what in the world are they doing? And why are they doing it like that? Where did they ever read in the Bible about doing it like that? I quickly caught myself 
and could know that if they came and visited with us, they'd think that's a little strange that they have these people go up front and then march down and pass the communion. If we're going to do it like they did it in the Bible, we'd probably need to be doing it on Thursday night, sitting around a table, or maybe reclining. Oh, my. I think it is exceedingly difficult for all of us to understand how much our personal family tree and how much our congregational family tree heritage has to do with whom we associate and how we practice. The way congregations conduct their song service, we've got people now that flash the songs on the screen. We don't do that. But I can remember when we first felt like we would benefit if we had a leader or a couple of more leaders on each voice part up to the front since we sing four-part harmony instead of chanting that maybe we could have a more inspirational song service. And that was different. And it maybe created a little discomfort. Whatever caused you to want to do it like that? Well, whatever caused us to do it like we do it already was one guy standing up leading singing. Did you really think there was a book, chapter, and verse to tell us exactly how to do that? Do we not understand how much we're influenced by our culture? Okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you quite a bit now about my personal family tree and my congregational heritage that causes me to think a great deal like I think. And you may be sitting out there and saying, Sir, we don't care what your family tree looks like or what your cultural background is. We don't care because that was not mine. The reason I want to tell you mine is because I don't know yours. But you've got one. And I don't care what congregation you came from before you started gathering with this congregation. It had a heritage, a history that influenced the way that it practiced and its traditions and its habits and so forth. That's the human predicament that we're in. So I'm going to ask you, and I know there's going to be at least one person here in the crowd that could raise his hand, and I normally don't ask you to be raising hands because that can be kind of embarrassing sometimes. But I'm going to, I'm going to, make, it, I'm going to make it a little different. I want to ask you, how many of you in this congregation know who Nimrod Lafayette Clark is or was? I see two hands two hands. I know one of the brothers in the congregation here, Brother Gene Shelburne back there, has personally met Nimrod Lafayette Clark. I never did. But I do know that he had a tremendous influence on my mother and daddy. And I know Gene would tell you that he had a large influence on Gene's daddy and mother. Most people didn't know him by Nimrod Lafayette Clark. They knew him as N.L. Clark. And I'll guarantee you, if my mother and daddy had named me Nimrod Lafayette, I'd go by N.L. also. <laughs> so that's the name that he actually went by. Well, Nimrod Clark, N.L. Clark, was born in 1870 and lived until 1956, 86 years old. And he was the first president of Gunter Bible College just northeast of Dallas, Texas. And he served as president for Gunter Bible College for nine years. And that's where my mother and daddy met. 
he had a powerful influence on them. Thing that's unusual about N.L. Clark is that he really did not like the idea of churches having Sunday school. I couldn't even begin to tell you why all of the reasons. I do know that he kind of felt like maybe the Sunday school was supplanting the role of the parents. Fathers, bring up your children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Uh, teach your children. Uh, and, uh, and he felt like it maybe was a distraction in some other ways. I couldn't even begin to explain all of that, but I do know that it became a volatile issue in the years, decades following that, that caused churches to withdraw fellowship from each other and not even have anything to do with each other. Is there biblical justification for that? Oh, Cole Stanley, where are you, brother? Uh, I said Cole Stanley. I mean Drummond. I know who he is. Uh, uh, Cole Stanley is our mayor of the city of Amarillo right now. Excuse me for that. Uh, I want to pass out something, and I hesitated to do this. And as these gentlemen are passing out uh, something that I'd like for us to read together, I can only imagine how my own parents would react to this because they would say, don't be reading something that is not the Bible. Well, let me tell you something. Every time you come to church, a church meeting, and you listen to a preacher, you're listening to something that is not the Bible. You're listening to somebody who, as, who is a fallible human being who does not have perfect understanding of all things, but who loves the Lord and loves the Word of God and is trying to do something to help us understand and read the Bible better. And so, my own mother did not want me to read religious books other than the Bible for fear that I would be influenced by the thinking of human beings rather than being influenced just by the simple Word of God. Well, I finally came to realize, my dear mother, every time you go to church and listen to a preacher, you're, you're listening to words that are somebody's attempt to try to help us understand the Bible better, but they're not the Bible. And maybe written words are better to help us understand than preached words because of the fact that the, the written word usually is more carefully thought out. I know when I sit down and write a manuscript, I think about it more carefully and go back and edit and re-examine it than I do when I'm standing up here talking to you like this right now. Okay, so what I've passed out, or, or these helpers have passed out today, is something that was written. If you're looking in the upper left-hand corner, if you didn't get a copy, raise your hand. We'll get you one. Uh, we got some people back there in the booth that didn't get it. Okay. Uh, this was written in March of 1937. How many years ago is that? Long time ago. But this is part of my heritage that causes me to think and assemble where I do and think like I think because the man that wrote this had a very powerful influence on my parents who met and got married at the college where he was the first president. Gunner Bible College eventually closed down and moved to Littlefield, Texas to become Littlefield Bible College. It didn't last there very long, but it was closely associated with Lockney Bible College. None of those three colleges exist now, but they had a powerful influence on my parents, which of course had a powerful influence on me. I want you to hear, I want you to read with me, we'll try to read through it pretty quickly here, as we're hearing what N.L. Clark wrote about the tendency for us to disagree about biblical matters and consequently divide over it. 
this is our position number two. And the first position that you don't have in hand, he was explaining why that our movement started out as being a non-denominational movement. In other words, the history of our movement was that anybody who confessed Christ as a son of God and who respected the teachings of God's word, the Bible, as being authoritative was to be received and loved as our brother or sister in the Lord. And you didn't have to conform to a certain denominational identification. And that will become more apparent as we read through this. But he says differences of opinion are inevitable. That's right under the title. Differences of opinion are inevitable. Such differences, unless they involve fundamentals, should never cause open division. Now, I personally see a little problem right there with when he said, unless they involve fundamentals. Unless they involve fundamentals. You know what the problem is? We human beings can't even agree on what are the fundamentals. I know in our history... It's kind of become less of a thing now, but some of you may remember in the history of our particular stream of history how that people divided and wouldn't fellowship each other over how the communion was served and how many cups were used. They had the one cup movement, and you had to be, you had to only have one cup that was passed to the whole congregation. Everybody drank out of the same cup because Jesus took the cup and blessed it. And so they made a big deal out of that, believe it or not. And the people who were hung up on that thought that it was a fundamental, and they had to make it a test of fellowship. So I see a little problem in those three lines right under the title. We've got to be careful even in trying to understand the fundamentals. Uh, I've had an eyeball transplant. Let me go ahead and see if I can put my glasses on and read the rest of this. I'm going to try to read pretty hurriedly, but I want, you to, I want you to see this because this man was a preacher. He was a writer, and he's part of the heritage of this congregation. In my last article, N.L. Clark says, our first position is that men may be just such Christians as there were in the time of the apostles in all essential respects. In other words, right now in Amarillo, Texas, far removed from Jerusalem, far removed from 2,000 years ago, it's possible for people, and you need to read people where he says men. He was writing in a different era when, when men was understood to be both genders in this kind of a statement. Our first position is that men may be just such Christians as there were in the time of the apostles in all essential respects. All such people, either then or now, are children of God, brethren in Christ. They may differ in their interpretation of some of the Lord's sayings, whether these apply to the past, present, or future. No two brothers in the flesh, unless very weak mentally, can be found to understand or believe everything alike after they pass early childhood. This is too self-evident to need comment. Yet we meet men who say that Christians must agree on every detail of church work and see everything the Lord said in exactly the same light. Such conclusions come from strained interpretations of passages that emphasize unity. There are, for example, passages that says, brethren, see that you all speak the same thing. And that has to be understood in its context. Of course... Perfect unity on every question would be an ideal state if that unity were based upon the Lord's truth. But this condition among the believers presupposes perfection in knowledge, a state we shall never reach in this life and probably not even in the life to come. From these observations, we conclude that differences of opinion are sure to obtain his language is a little archaic here. We would say these differences of opinion are sure to be present among the Lord's people. I am inclined to believe, however, that patient, prayerful, and persistent study of all the Lord said on a subject in the light of other subjects and of the laws of reason will tend to bring contending parties closer together. 
I am sure that a disposition to cling to one's own view while refusing to hear the other side of a question in dispute tends to drive men further apart. But that intelligent men can ever agree perfectly on every question that may be raised over religion is a presumption that is not supported by either human nature, human experience, or the limitation of divine revelation. I don't think he's intending to put a limitation on the divine revelation other than the limitations of human beings to perfectly understand divine revelation and not be influenced by their culture. Not one single case is found in Holy Writ where even inspired men were brought together long that they did not suffer, differ over something. Note, for example, the case of Peter and Paul or that of Paul and Barnabas. From what I have said, it is clear that fellowship, brotherhood, and the Lord's work must be based on a, upon a few fundamental things. These things make us babes in Christ and leave us to grow to manhood by feeding upon the Lord's provisions to that end. When he says that our fellowship in the brotherhood of the Lord's work must be based upon a few fundamental things, I'm talking about believing that there is a God and that the God described in the Bible is the true God and that the Bible is the authoritative word of God, there are those fundamental things. And I'm saying that most people who claim to be followers of Jesus Christ probably accept those things, but we find ourselves so divided on so many issues. He leaves us, he leaves to each uh, the selection and use of that portion of the Lord's bounty that suits his circumstances and desires. The, re the result will inevitably be to produce, to produce of human beings who differ naturally, to produce a group of Christians who also differ in their attitude toward many questions. But, says one, men must agree if they work together, if they differ, they will be divided in sentiment, if not openly. This is exactly where faith, love, and knowledge are involved. Faith unites where all believe the same. Love compromises where doubt beclouds the way. Knowledge acquired by patient and prayerful study dispels the darkness and makes its possessors stronger in the Lord. Since it is evident that Christians may differ and yet be brethren, may we expect to find congregations of Christians all alike? N.L. Clark answers no. The pictures drawn in the New Testament writings of the churches therein mentioned indicate that each had its peculiarities. These were due to various things such as location, character of the membership, social customs, and so forth. Each had its problems and no doubt each had some peculiarities in its work that are not mentioned. Those things particular, peculiar to the church in Corinth or in other places that Paul discusses were the things he considered important. Well, did you read about the seven churches in the first part of the book of Revelation? Did you notice they're not all alike? Did you notice that they had different issues, different problems? The idea that brethren should separate because they disagree has been the prolific source of all the divisions that have cursed the church. Heresy, as men have defined it, has driven many thousands away from the fellowship of their brethren to be followed in many instances by persecution in its most cruel forms. Such a course causes hatred and division where love and union once prevailed. It is easy to see that brethren who do not agree often treat each other worse than they would members of, we should say, the other denominations. In other words, even in the churches of Christ in the history of our movement, we've sometimes been more harsh and more divisive even than with those who differ much more significantly than us. New Testament, uh, well, I, I want to finish that sentence. This shows a lack of that kind of brother, brotherly love that belongs to all true Christians. New Testament Christians were disciples that is, pupils or learners of Christ. They were not supposed, even under inspiration, to know all things. Paul spoke of some who knew things freely given them of God. 
Again, he mentions knowledge as one of the gifts of the Spirit. Nevertheless, he admonishes Timothy to study. And Peter exhorts brethren to desire the sincere milk of the word that they might grow thereby. With such instruction before us, it seems strange that so many men would insist upon making their ideas of doubtful questions tests of fellowship with others. This, however, is but a manifestation of human weakness. The child thinks it knows better than its parents what it should do. The freshman in college is often more conceited than his aged or learned preceptor or professor would say. And an ignorant beginner in the Lord's work often imagines he knows all about a subject he has never really studied. This is where humility as a virtue shines. It is one of the most beautiful and valuable of the Christian graces. It can never dwell in the same house with conceit. What you have just heard is a sermon in writing by a man that's now been dead since 1956. He is a part of my spiritual heritage. He is a part of the spiritual heritage of this church. And churches of Christ as a movement, as a historical movement, have gotten unfortunately a reputation of being a little bit judgmental and a little bit egotistical in our history. In fact, this particular congregation has been criticized rather openly over the last few decades of being too open to interact with other congregations of God's people in our city and in our world. Well, okay, I know, I know, you're going to talk to me about the length. And so I'm going to try to wrap it up real fast now with four quick points. Somebody may be hearing what I'm saying and saying, then we can never say we know anything for sure. I'm not saying that at all. The fact that we cannot know everything does not mean that we cannot know anything. And I feel very confident that we all think we really do know some things that we probably are right about. But the second point I want to make is the fact that none of us is smart enough to know everything and we can learn from each other. I don't like to think that because I'm standing up here getting to do all the talking today that you have to listen to me and you don't have a right to react or have a different opinion. And I want you to know, as long as you'll be very kind and loving about it, I don't even mind you coming to me and say, Brother, I think you were wrong about that. Now, if you get too mean about it, I'll probably react negatively. I'll try not to. But we can learn from each other. We can learn from other religious bodies. I'm talking about Christian congregations that come from a different stream of history. We can learn from them. They can learn from us if we can learn in humility to share. Number three, we should not ever hesitate to discuss our understandings and emphasize our convictions. You may feel like that what I'm saying this morning says that, well, we, we don't, we're not smart enough to ever be able to say anything to anybody with certainty about it. We need to just be very careful. Well, we do need to be careful, but there's nothing wrong with us expressing our deepest heartfelt convictions about what's right and wrong about the Christian faith. As long as it is done in humility and gentleness and love. If we ever find ourselves talking to others about our faith and we lose our spirit of humility, if we lose our gentleness, and if we don't speak in an attitude of love, we need to stop right there and go pray about ourselves and sleep on it, maybe take a long walk. That brings me to my fourth and final point. If tensions 
and emotions begin to degenerate into anger when we're talking to someone about our faith or about our differences of practice and opinion, we need to immediately stop and go back and reread the passage about the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5, love, joy, peace, patience, long-suffering, kindness. Against such there is no law. I have a passion that we have a great, or that we work toward a greater spirit of unity among the people of God that the world might believe. I think Jesus knew what he was talking about, don't you? 